thank you very much, uh, Volodymyr, and uh, hi everyone here. Uh, I really uh, was interested in uh, in the conference and um, the fact that we are here on Sunday. Um, for me, it's not unusual, uh, even if it's an, uh, the last day of a weekend. But um, usually, I forgot Sundays and I confuse them with Mondays. So, uh, <laughs> and I'm sure that uh, looking at your uh, smiles and um, you share this uh, this way of dealing with things. I mean, uh, we are talking about integrity, which does not take into account uh, Mondays, Sundays. Um, so, uh, a few words about uh, me. Um, so, um, I came up on this matter of integrity when I was in uh, the Faculty of Philology in Bucharest. So, I, I was in my third year and um, I was uh, working on my uh, paper and uh, suddenly I realized when uh, reading a newly released book in Romanian that some of the pages sound for me in English. And uh, as uh, I had a very good memory at that time, I won't really say that I have it now, but uh, it was really extraordinary at that time. Uh, it was a photographic memory I had. Um, I went to the uh, library and found the book. Uh, it was a uh, book in English from uh, 32. And uh, I identified 12 pages which were similar, in fact, were translated without the proper quotation uh, into Romanian. And uh, the author of that newly released book was uh, one of my professors at the university. So you can imagine the, uh, let's say, the shock uh, I had. Um, I'm not sure that I knew the word plagiarism by that time. I was really outraged uh, by the fact that uh, someone took um, a text from someone else and passed it out as being his own. And it was later that I was to discover that was, this is uh, one of the common definition definitions of plagiarism. What I did was to, I had courage because Volodymyr, you remember 12 minutes ago, he spoke about courage. Uh, I had it at that time and it seems that uh, even later and uh, went to my uh, dean and told him about this. And the dean told me bluntly, we know this. Professor, he sometimes forgot to put quotation marks. Better finish your paper, Marian. That was all. And uh, I went on uh, and, uh, well, uh, I uh, just jumped to 2012 when I was um, uh, elected president of the Ethic Committee of the University of Bucharest. I didn't want to. Um, I was uh, in a uh, group of people. Uh, each, each faculty was supposed to nominate someone in the ethic committee and uh, I ultimately accepted and after three rounds of uh, votes, uh, I accepted to be president because I didn't want to. And uh, I had this idea that uh, ethics, that's something when you do mistakes and is there is someone there to punish you. So that was a little bit all. Uh, no, that was not all. I mean, uh, in the meantime, from the faculty when I was a student up to 2012, uh, I've read a lot from Aristotle to Immanuel Kant about moral values, philosophy, and so on and so on. So I'll be honest with you, I knew some things about uh, uh, 
ethics, virtue, about uh, the philosophy, moral philosophy, and so on. But uh, I was there in the capacity of acting in a practical way, not in a theoretical way as member and president of the uh, ethic committee of the university. Uh, what was on then in Romania was the plagiarized thesis of the prime minister. And that was our first case. It just happened. And uh, everybody asked the University of Bucharest to state a point of view about this plagiarized thesis. So we are talking about a prime minister in office uh, at that time, and we did it. I had to persuade my rector. I had to persuade colleagues. They, uh, one after another, they uh, quit the ethic committees because there was a huge pressure then in Romania. But finally, we uh, analyzed and made public our point of view about this uh, plagiarized thesis. And from then on, uh, I began to really learn a lot about what Salim uh, Reza said about uh, the integrity, uh, the whole uh, complex issue of uh, integrity. I uh, began to take part in the public debates in Romania to put, um, to ask people to consider this issue of integrity in our academic establishment. I uh, achieved uh, rules, um, uh, standard um, tools to be applied uh, in my university. And uh, I have to confess that not everybody is happy with this. I mean, I saw a lot of resistance coming from my colleagues, coming from managers of my university. When some of them saw me <laughs> at the rectorate, um, they say, oh, how are you, uh, Mr. Popescu, professor? Uh, you're still doing this integrity, ethics? Uh, uh, and usually I said, yes, but what are you doing? And at that moment, the conversation just was cut and uh, they took me seriously. So I asked them, vice rectors, rector, to really be involved in integrity policies. I was to develop uh, as a uh, president of the ethic committees. And uh, since uh, three years ago, uh, when I created the uh, Center for Academic Integrity of the University of Bucharest to, um, to be really aware and concerned about initiatives, uh, even at the national level, uh, about academic integrity. So um, I organized, I asked the rectors of the best five universities in Romania to nominate people in a working group which still exists, uh, to work on a common integrity policy for uh, this consortium of the five universities. I did it. It, um, it was uh, achieved. We, we did it last year. And now, and even now, it's not yet approved by the five best universities in Romania. Uh, well, uh, there are explanations, um, the pandemic context and so on and so on, but um, we are talking about a serious uh, matter here. So uh, that was in 2012, and I'll finish this uh, bio sketch and so on about my expertise in the uh, academic integrity uh, by uh, telling you about this uh, new uh, academic integrity actor coming out on the European stage, which is called IRAFPA. This is the Institute for Research and Action uh, concerning academic fraud and plagiarism. Uh, it's based in uh, Geneva and uh, now I'm a member of the boards of the Institute. Um, just 
48 hours ago, I finished the, uh, I have also an expertise in the theater and the film industry. Um, as a theater critic, uh, I'm a specialist expert in performing arts, uh, literature and so and cultural policies. And I finished 48 hours ago, the uh, editing of the first uh, web TV uh, broadcast of the Institute, which will be launched in February next year. It's about um, academic integrity. Is it a prisoner of the university establishments? So that's the point uh, where we at the Institute and I at the Center of Integrity uh, at my university began to really think about this uh, extraordinary paradox. We are having a lot of regulations, norms, codes of ethics, procedures, and so on. We have also uh, a lot of European tools like the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity and many, many more others. And the paradox is that fraud academic mis misconduct, uh, they are climbing up according to many reports, analyses, evaluations that have been made during past five years, maybe more if we are to go back. So how could we explain this? I mean, uh, I recognize the value of a code. I did one. I revised the code for my university, which was really a tremendous job. Me and one of my collaborators, we worked eight days without any Sundays or Mondays and so on to really uh, think about the difference between morality, deontology, uh, about norms, rules, and so on. And we discovered that the, uh, the old code was re really a little bit of an uh, old-fashioned clothes you really don't like to wear when you come out of your home. So it was worn out, uh, it was old fashioned, it was a lot, a lot of uh, um, phrases uh, which meant almost nothing in uh, our daily academic life. It was beautiful to have them like a poem coming from 19th century. But uh, poems from 19th century, they might be really extraordinary uh, in every and each literature, in Ukrainian, in English, in Romanian, and so on. But uh, when it comes to practical life in your university, things are completely changed. So um, that's uh, for this, uh, let's say, um, my uh, relationship with the academic integrity issue. Uh, Salim, I think, uh, talked or maybe some or, uh, someone of you put him a question and uh, the talk was about uh, being wrong, doing mistakes. Oh no, I think Volodymyr, uh, asked about, no, it was someone else who asked about the punishments. Yes, I remember now. Um, and um, Salim, he explained really very well what's about punishments and so on and so on. And um, I, um, three or four years ago, I went into a bookshop and found an, uh, a book, uh, The Third Thoughts, by a Nobel Prize uh, in Physics by uh, Steven Weinberg. And uh, one of the uh, small texts there was uh, entitled exactly like this, On Being Wrong. And uh, this uh, man of science, he was really extraordinary, not only in physics, but also uh, in some other uh, areas, he explained that being wrong means also to discover why you were being wrong and learn a lesson. If you do mistakes and you only punish them, uh, the, the educational value of a of an punishment is really very small. 
you'll have to be sure that whenever you put in place a punishment or a code regulation and so on, people would learn something from them. And for this, uh, you need something else. You don't need more codes, rules, uh, and so on and so on, but you, you need a different approach. So it's not about doing more, but it's about doing differently. And uh, one of the things that came into my mind during these years uh, is about uh, uh, what is an imposter? So uh, when we learn about plagiarism, cases, people, uh, sometimes they are our colleagues, sometimes they are our professors, sometimes they are our managers. So whenever we talk about uh, this issue, um, we discover that um, plagiarism is a fact of being imposter and it is always related to the past. So uh, it's uh, the same with uh, you, you do the, uh, the plagiarized uh, thesis or paper and uh, uh, you use it at a certain time by this is really uh, in the past. Uh, when it comes, this plagiarized thesis paper into the present, it's a lot of consequences. And these consequences uh, concerns also the past, what you did when you plagiarized, but also in the present, because of the consequences uh, really look into the present uh, situation. And I'll give you a, a very short example. Um, so the, uh, I mentioned the, uh, the former prime minister of Romania at that time. Uh, at the Institute uh, this year, we had an, uh, the Institute is really asked to really mediate, to give uh, advice, to get in touch with the most sensible uh, issues. And one of them is about a plagiarized thesis done by a political figure in France. He's a lawyer, the author, uh, who, um, to whom the uh, university at the end withdraw the doctorate. And the author of the plagiarized thesis uh, accused the university that the trial is on now in Paris, uh, accused the university that it didn't provide him proper training, training as a doctorate. Um, to, 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 to put it very bluntly, uh, he accused the fact that nobody in the commission, su supervisor and so on, uh, didn't train him to really write properly a doctoral thesis. Uh, well, so the, the case of Romanian prime minister in 2012 and this new uh, case in France, they have an, uh, an, a common denominator. Both people, they choose a shortcut to enter the uh, barrister association in their countries. So when you want to become a lawyer in Romania or in France and uh, in some other countries, you either uh, pass a doctorate in law or pass an exam, which is really very difficult. And some of the people, as these two ones, they choose the shortcut. So it's nothing immoral. I mean, the law allows it. But when the uh, the thesis was plagiarized, the whole context is uh, really uh, changed. So um, we are we are trying now um, on an European level by means of the uh, Institute for uh, Research and Action concerning the fraud and uh, plagiarism in university to really uh, change the the whole framework in which this academic integrity issue is put on now. That means that you'll have to consider, for instance, the, uh, the fact that um, every and each student is confronted with uh, 
what looks like being a very well-conceived mechanism to prevent in our academic establishments uh, the fraud, the uh, misconduct, uh, the harassment, because we will have to talk about many issues which concerns both ethics and integrity in our establishment. And um, despite all this um, formal put in place mechanism to prevent to prevent uh, uh, fraud and uh, the academic misconduct, uh, we realize that we don't pay attention to these. For instance, me and some other colleagues and friends, uh, we ask, usually we ask uh, our students when we uh, uh, start um, the course uh, at the beginning of the university year, if they read the uh, uh, Carta of the university, the Code of Ethics, the uh, regulations which concern their own stu uh, status as students. It's really very, very rare when they read this. So I'm talking about uh, our students, but it's also, and that's really an, uh, maybe not such a big surprise. It's also about our colleagues. They don't read this kind of uh, uh, legal uh, organizational framework in which, in fact, it's about our status in the university and the part we took in our responsibility towards our university and the society as a whole. So, uh, what is to be done? I mean, uh, well, you can't oblige someone to be uh, an ethic person. <laughs> You can't oblige. I mean, there were some people who tried uh, this um, uh, before '89 in uh, some of the countries in uh, in Europe, um, and I'm sure that um, you you suppose what I'm talking about. Uh, so one of the things we are thinking about is to really put in place an mechanism on a whole new culture of academic integrity. And we are doing this, we are trying to do this, uh, not only by these uh, documents, which are really important, but also through visual means. So we are trying to really uh, not only through opening a uh, web TV channel of the Institute, um, but also to uh, achieve um, workshops in which um, people involved in the integrity mechanisms in universities in Europe, starting from um, integrity advisors. You, you know that uh, France, they put in place uh, this um, function uh, three years ago. But their situations, their colleagues of ours in uh, the French universities uh, who are supposed to play uh, the role of uh, integrity advisors, uh, but uh, usually they are not listened to. I mean, the management uh, would rather keep them at a kind of a distance. Sometimes they lack expertise. Because one of the things we really need as uh, uh, professors, um, researchers, and so on, is a proper training in how to deal with these breaches in uh, academic integrity, with these faults in ethics, and so on. I mean, it's easy to read the book. Uh, and understand uh, theoretically what's to be at fault, what's to be vulnerable, and so on and so on. But when you are in a situation to deal with a victim, and now I'm coming to another serious point, which should really be taken into account when changing the framework of uh, how we deal with academic integrity in uh, our universities, it's about victims. 
I told you that uh, a little bit before that uh, usually people don't pay attention to uh, these uh, ethics, integrity issues, but they are really and suddenly uh, being uh, attentive to this when they are in a victim-like situation. I mean, when they discover that their doctoral supervisor uh, really uh, took one of their research reports and published under his or her name. Uh, they realize that they are victims when uh, when they apply for an, uh, let's say, uh, lecturer or uh, assistant or uh, professor job at the university, and there are two, three or four candidates there. And when the academic CV uh, shows that this person is really the best qualified to take the job and after, at the end, it was another one who took the job. Uh, you feel like uh, being uh, really uh, uh, discarded from the game of the university uh, um, frame. Why is this? Another thing is about this uh, interview. So you apply for the job. And uh, you'll have to deliver a lecture. It depends on the uh, on the job, uh, and you'll have this interview issue. And I'll give you an example which happened at my university. Um, so one of the candidates was asked. It was the very first question the commission put to him: Why is that that you didn't study abroad, and you did all studies in Romania? And the candidate, uh, who's really a very bright mind, uh, uh, he realized on the spot that that was a discriminating, a big discriminating question being put uh, to him because one of the other three candidates did exclusively his studies abroad. So uh, that's an, uh, really an, uh, an ethical question. So um, I uh, talked to my rector without giving names because I, I knew the name of the member of the commission who put the question. And uh, the, uh, the rector really f uh, froze because, you know, everybody, even at the management, the top management level, um, think that uh, these things will be kept on uh, silence. We'll, we'll, we won't talk about this. So if you have the courage, and this is really a very good point, uh, if you have the courage to really put the question to who's in charge to answer this question, some, sometimes you may uh, get a sense of uh, really something should be changed. But some other time you'll be, uh, let's say, confronted with an omerta philosophy and way of doing. You know, talking about omerta, one of my uh, colleagues um, uh, from uh, the University of Coimbra, a professor there, she, uh, in a public meeting, uh, she said uh, the uh, um, the uh, underground world, the mafia, uh, they talk also about integrity. They have a code of honor. And he's right. I mean, <laughs> but uh, you'll have to kill with integrity. You can't denounce, you can't be a whistleblower in the mob in the mafia because you'll be punished. So you'll have to have these moral codes, integrity and so on and so on. Uh, but uh, you know, the difference uh, about these two worlds is that in the first one, you may be killed physically, while in the second one, in the university level, you may be killed spiritually. Your career just can end. And I'm talking here about women, young women and the young men, uh, brilliant researchers and extraordinary uh, uh, teachers who are really 
at a certain point of their academic career confronted with this kind of uh, situations. So um, one of the things uh, we, uh, we do at the Institute is to try and reduce the spreading of this imposter culture in our universities. Um, it's only, it's every week I read articles uh, uh, from different sources, academic uh, or not, about another case, about a report uh, which states that uh, at that university in uh, United Kingdom or in uh, the United States or in uh, Romania, uh, it, <clears throat> they, made, they made an analysis of the corruption level in the academic milieu, you know, this is a subject we really don't like to talk. I mean, corruption in our university, it's, so this analysis, uh, as I, as I said, they are, they are, they are, they put in front of us a trend, uh, which is uh, really, uh, does uh, worry a lot of people in, uh, in the world. I mean, we have this, uh, well, these structures at the European level, at the global level. We were in touch with the representatives of uh, many of them at an international colloquium we had the, at the University of Coimbra. Um, they, 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 do, they do a good job, but uh, this is not all. I mean, uh, you remember uh, perhaps uh, when talking about the imposter, we'll have to really remember an extraordinary character in Moliere's uh, uh, plays. It's about Tartuffe. Everybody in the house there, from where Tartuffe was installed from the very beginning, knew that he was an imposter. Only the, the, the head of the house, Monsieur Orgon, uh, he didn't want to accept this uh, reality. And it was when uh, Tartuffe uh, assaulted sexually his wife that he realized uh, uh, what was uh, all about. But uh, he was really very disappointed about this. So what I want to say is that Tartuffe is among us, yes, uh, and when we discover that he is an imposter, is uh, really too late. What we have to do is uh, really to to put in place uh, a real culture of academic integrity, such as the uh, the door for this imposters for uh, people who are really not competent in their jobs, but they uh, aspire to higher functions in our academic uh, system should be as, uh, as much as possible closed. I know that's impossible. That's ideal. But what we can do is really to, uh, to really restrain the possibilities for them to get to these positions. This is one thing. And the other one is to try and educate and train our students in this culture of uh, academic honesty, which might be also a very, very good lesson to uh, develop uh, the character. Because, you know, uh, we rely a lot of technology nowadays, but uh, less and less on character. We really should do more about this, and it's a lot that could be done. You'll have to, to have courage to do this. So um, I'm looking at the, uh, so we, I think we are reaching, because I, I really expect uh, uh, um, uh, to engage in a uh, conversation uh, with you. Um, and um, I can to tell you a lot of things, but we'll have to really resume and think of the fundamental matters. It's not about definitions. You listen to a lot of wise, and they are really wise, competent people giving you definitions, which is okay, we need this. 
But remember, uh, this guy Aristotle, this guy Kant, this uh, John Locke, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and all the others, they, they gave a lot, a lot of definitions. What we need now is really to live through integrity. Is it possible? I don't know. 